Okay, we're live now. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of ND Line Online. Our topic today is system change, not climate change. As usual, we have our dear Tito Joe with us. Hello, Tito Joe. And um, yeah, we can uh, start with the first question. I would say. So our first question, how effective are the so-called frameworks on the restoration and protection of biodiversity in reversing the effect of the degradation of nature? To this day, to this day 84% of the energy use in the world is based on fossil fuels like coal, oil, gas, and methane. The imperialist powers and their oil, gas, and coal monopolies obscure this fact and avoid committing themselves to any definite program of producing dependence on fossil fuel and increasing reliance on renewable energy like solar, wind, tidal, hydrogen, and so on. By a definite program, I mean solid time-bound targets for the industrialized states that will markedly slow down global warming and bring average temperatures to a lower and more stable equilibrium. They minimize the problem of carbon emissions and global warming by simply referring to the need to keep the global average of 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels as limit to temperature increases of the Earth's surface in the next 20 years. And faintly mention that going past the tipping point of two degrees Celsius means accelerating the catastrophic phenomena of heat waves, forest fires, prolonged droughts, melting of the icebergs, rise of the level and acidity of the seas, tsunamis, super typhoons, and other extreme weather conditions. But then they belittle the already disastrous impacts of climate catastrophes that are already occurring with increasing frequency in the past 25 years since the Kyoto Protocol was signed but snubbed by the biggest carbon emitters, then to appease the entire world and distract us from their remorseless efforts to further emasculate the Kyoto Protocol and the Paris Agreement of 2015, they propose all sorts of frameworks and proposals, such as voluntary decarbonization, carbon trades, net zero emissions, restoration and protection of biodiversity. There are no compulsory provisions for them to comply with, even as they have the highest ability to adopt renewable energy faster than the underdeveloped countries. They avoid uh, having to pay tax for all the carbon industrial emissions that they have done to worsen the greenhouse gas effect on the atmosphere and damage the ozone layer since the rise of monopoly capitalism, or earlier, since uh, um, 1761, at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. They even try with might and main to use the climate crisis as reason to prevent the industrial development of underdeveloped countries and the processing of their own mineral resources. Salama, Tito. Um, so before we um, look at the grassroots movement um, and fighting for climate injustice, we're just talking about the government approach at the moment. So as another um, follow-up question, in what way can this framework of restoring and protecting biodiversity aid in reducing the negative effect of human activity? First of all, we should not allow the fossil fuel imperialist powers to take cover under the phrase human activity, 
They are the inhuman culprits for the climate crisis. The imperialists blame human activity in an abstract metaphysical sense in a clever but obvious attempt to uh, blame uh, uh, the victims or spread the blame on all of humanity for causing climate change. Restoring and protecting biodiversity is a desirable objective and should be part of a serious systematic of program of producing dependence on fossil fuels and increasing renewable energy at an accelerated rate. All types of land and natural resource use, especially intensive land use for production must be regulated so as not to worsen the already degraded situation, especially of forest and marine biomes, which function both as the world's most stable diversity, biodiversity of uh, sanctuaries and also as its biggest lungs, capturing carbon dioxide and producing oxygen and thus able to offset to some degree the huge carbon emissions of industrial capitalist economies. However, many reactionary states use biodiversity as a motherhood slogan to pit environmentalists and poor communities against each other by redirecting the environmental blame on poor peasants, fisher folk, and other small producers whose subsistence livelihoods may add to diminished natural resources, but only in minute increments. Meanwhile, the imperialist corporate land grabbers, extractive profiteers, and polluters who in fact are the biggest culprits in biodiversity depletion worldwide are left off the hook. Salama Tito. So to get to our second question, what can the government policies and or the laws do to combat the climate crisis? Laws or policies such as poverty alleviation, economic policies, tax implementation, etc. The people of every country should be aroused, organized and mobilized to demand and propose definite solutions to the climate crisis and compel the government to adopt and implement policies and laws to reduce dependency on fossil fuel and increase reliance on renewable energy. They should demand and compel their governments to adopt strategies of comprehensive economic development in industry, agriculture, services, urban and rural habitats, trade and finance, which enhance the said solutions to the climate crisis. Some of these solutions should fall into the category of mitigating measures, others adaptive measures, but all must be equitable and sustainable instead of being just short-term remedies that benefit only a few. The overwhelming majority of non-imperialist countries should use their democratic weight to compel the fossil fuel imperialist powers to agree solutions for the benefit of humankind. What about the climate finance mechanism? In what way will this save the uh, the climate, the world, or the climate? Uh, so far, all the so-called green financial policies offered by the imperialist powers are in their favor against the underdeveloped and middling countries of the world. A climate finance policy and mechanism to save humankind should require the fossil fuel imperialist powers uh, to pay tax for the loss and damage that they have done since the advent of monopoly capitalism in England in mid 19th century. And loans must be extended or outright compensation must be extended to the underdeveloped countries 
to enable them to import less fuel and to further develop renewable energy and to pursue their own drive towards industrial development without repeating the environmental uh, sins or wrongs of the advanced industrial powers. Due consideration must be given to underdeveloped countries to develop their own fossil fuel in combination with the development of renewable energy systems and carbon capture technologies that are cheap, decentralized, and truly effective in ensuring the transition to clean energy. In this regard, there have been good proposals on climate finance that have been pushed by many climate justice NGOs and people's movements such as Ebon International, Oxfam, and this uh, civil society organization partnership for development effectiveness. This should be studied and seriously considered by the financially more capable industrial powers. Third question. So during the climate crisis special we had a few weeks ago now, um, um, yeah, uh, we asked you this uh, in the opening episode. Um, yeah, but again, how can those tote bags or canvas bags, metal or reusable straws, etc., reduce the waste humans are producing? Isn't it just um, another form of mass production, considering how many of these ecological, eco-friendly um, products are being produced and how much more reusable products are being developed? Plastics and other synthetic materials, which are non-biodegradable, are byproducts of monopoly oil production. Thus, they have become a widespread and growing problem. While the oil monopolies cannot be prevented soon from producing plastics, this can be recycled into useful products like bricks for construction, discarded metals, canvas bags, uh, reusable straws, uh, can be systematically collected and recycled. The lifestyle shift to non-plastic substitutes for consumer products can be seen in its two aspects. From one aspect, it could be a small but positive start of much bigger and long-term uh, shift in social values and lifestyles that gives a high premium to ecological consciousness and responsibility. Such a shift may thus represent real system change, which is uh, what the peoples of the world aspire for. But from another aspect, a no plastic stance can simply be an easy tokenist way for big monopolies to greenwash their business operations. Environmental activists must be conscious of this duality in certain ecological lifestyle positions and continually push not just for personal lifestyle change, but for social system change. Um, and what about the Kyoto Protocol? So apart from the US and China not signing up on the said protocol, why did it fail? Is P Kyoto Protocol a failure uh, from the very start? Um, from the very beginning. The Kyoto Pro Pro Protocol failed because the U.S. and other major fossil fuel producers and users like China did not sign up. It exempted the developing countries from any liability for damage to the environment and granted credits to them, which the developing countries could buy to further generate carbon emissions. Thus, the protocol has been widely rejected as no solution to the problem of carbon emissions and global warming. Um, and how did the parties involved in the Kyoto Protocol handle or penalize Russia, the US and China for rejecting the protocol? There are no effective provisions in the protocol to penalize Russia, US and China for rejecting the protocol. 
In the first place, a state can be liable only for what it signs as an agreement with the validity and effect of a treaty. The U.S. took the lead in denouncing the Kyoto Protocol as unjustly favoring the developing countries. After the Kyoto Protocol, um, the next uh, nodal point that we have is the Paris Agreement, um, or just Paris is the next yeah, nodal point of the climate conferences. Um, how effective is the Paris Agreement of 2015? The Paris Agreement of 2015 set as goal to keep the average temperature of the Earth's surface at 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial level and to prevent it from reaching 2 degrees. But there are no provisions for limiting the production and use of fossil fuel and for penalizing non-compliance with the limitations. Follow-up question. Um, why do all these agreements come with very few concrete penalties when faced with shortcomings? What does it say about the seriousness of the parties involved um, if we fail to um, have provisions for, for, uh, for penalties? The conferences of parties called to make these agreements include the fossil fuel imperialists and are subject to the control of the oil, gas, and coal monopolies. Thus, there are no effective provisions for the reduction of carbon emissions and the increase of renewable energy. There are also no provisions for penalizing violations of the agreement. Here is an example of fossil fuel imperialist double talk at a press conference during the UN Climate Summit in Glasgow. Joe Biden attacked Putin and Xi Jinping for their absence and therefore failing to take a leadership role. At the same time, he demanded from OPEC countries that they pump more oil. For our next question, From as a, this is their seventh question. Um, from the Kyoto Protocol to the Paris Agreement, and now to Glasgow. Why, after all these years of conferences of the parties, lengthy discussions and agreement, we keep on failing to solve the climate crisis? Do you have any idea what is happening closed uh, behind closed doors? Well, I have already pointed to the fossil fuel imperialists and their oil, gas, and coal monopolies. After all, these meetings come under the bannerhead of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. Framework agreements are general declarations of intent and, not, uh, and are not as detailed and rigorous as agreements that are meant to be enforced and to penalize violations. Another follow-up question to this one. So what can we expect um, from the Glasgow conference? Uh, the results are already known. There are pontifications about keeping the average temperature increase of the Earth's surface at 1.5 degrees Celsius above uh, pre-industrial levels and for net zero carbon emission. Uh, but there are still no clear provisions for systematically reducing the 84% global usage of fossil fuel and for penalizing violations of agreement. Uh, but for the first time, uh, the, uh, the agreement includes recognition of the need to reduce uh, dependence on uh, fossil fuel, but not a single country has uh, uh, given, has a uh, push for uh, an implementable agreement. Uh, uh, several countries have just uh, uh, made promises to reduce their uh, carbon emissions and nothing more. Um, so we've been talking about um, these empty promises of government, of the government, um, of governments <laughs> better. Um, 
And so now let's talk about more grassroots um, ways of going about um, solving climate injustice. So are there other organizations or movements across the globe that fight against climate injustice and how different is their approach from the national democratic forces who are also concerned about um, the climate? There are many people's organizations and movements across the globe that fight against climate injustice. The majority of them condemn imperialism or monopoly capitalism as culpable for destroying the environment, degrading it and bringing about the climate crisis. They do not differ from the national democratic forces in the Philippines in waging political struggles against imperialist powers and the local puppets and in demanding system change to solve the climate, the climate crisis. However, in the Philippines, there is also a people's democratic revolution trying to stop the imperialist powers from raking in super profits by obliging the Philippines to import fossil fuel and allowing them to operate logging, mining, and plantation companies that destroy and degrade the environment, deprive the people of the land, and uh, poison the streams towards the land holdings of Filipinos, especially the, uh, the poor peasants. There are similar revolutionary movements in other countries that have a strong component of environmental protection and defense of resources against imperialist plunder, such as in India and Kurdistan. Uh, thank you for um, clarifying that. Um, and as a, a follow-up um, question, um, to this one, um, given the different approaches and ideologies, what is the best way to unite with the various organizations that have the same goal that we do? There are wide environmental, social, economic, political, and cultural grounds for uniting the various organizations which are for climate justice and system change against imperialism. We should not impose any ideology on them. It is enough that there is a focused concern about the climate crisis and unity is encouraged and developed on anti-imperialist and democratic grounds. Various organizations in various countries can have their strategy and tactics and struggle according to concrete conditions. While we emphasize unity on climate justice and system change, it must also be noted that in certain advanced capitalist countries, there are a handful of NGOs that are well-funded by giant monopoly groups. They often join the calls for climate justice, but limit their concrete demands to lobbying for profit-driven green solutions that are either nothing more than corporate PR, greenwashing campaigns, or to sell new kinds of lucrative investments such as super expensive geoengineering and carbon capture projects, mega dams and the like. These are basically false solutions and must be exposed, although this does not require patient research, although this does require patient research, mass education and information campaigns directed at many citizen groups that uh, may find such solutions appealing. about that um so um for our next um question and our second to last i think question for now um we saw that oh actually no that's not true <laughs> sorry um we saw that the ilps is present in glasgow as the chairman emeritus of the broadest anti-imperialist organization can you enlighten us on the importance of building a broader unity of an anti-imperialist front in fighting climate change? The ILPS was present in Glasgow in order to make its demands for solving the climate crisis 
and to call for a broad united front against imperialist powers responsible for the climate crisis. Building a broader unity and an anti-imperialist front in solving the climate crisis is highly important and indispensable for the survival and social progress of humankind. The climate crisis is not just some transient problem, but has become almost as wired into the imperialist system as its other fundamental self-contradictions such as financial crisis, um, wars, fascism, and national oppression. It may well be an important arena in the forthcoming people's battles against imperialism. The ILPS commitment to address the imperialist roots of the climate crisis is a strategic decision that is consistent with its program and constituency. For our, I'm sorry. Um, so as a, another um, question, um, why is the, I'm sorry, uh, I just uh, got confused for a while. Um, why is the Philippines the second on the list of the most dangerous countries to the to be an environmental activist? Um, who are these environmental activists and what kind of intimidation do they face? According to Global Witness as of 2020, the Duterte regime was responsible for killing extrajudicially 227 defenders of the land and environment. These are people defending their homes, land, and livelihoods, and ecosystems vital for biodiversity and the climate. They include social and religious activists and indigenous people resisting the drive of the regime to auction off land and natural resources to foreign monopoly companies. The regime is at the forefront of the most rapacious and powerful exploiters, which include not just these foreign companies, but also their big comprador landlord bureaucrat capitalist allies that benefit from the land grabbing and plunder. Thus, the forces of coercion and intimidation are not just the regime's military and police forces, but also various kinds of private armies, security agencies, and hired killers. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I might have been muted. Um, so as we all know, not just environmental activists are um, are uh, the target of the Duterte regime. Um, what does, and to follow up on this question, what does this say about the political situation in the country in general, I suppose, um, in this case? The political situation in the Philippines is worsening rapidly because Duterte is carrying out a policy of state terrorism under the so-called Anti-Terror Act, which he railroaded last year in order to accelerate the red tagging of all his opponents and critics and frame them up for abduction, torture, and murder. Duterte is also using drone surveillance, attack helicopters, artillery, and aerial bombs to attack indigenous communities excuse me no. okay Sorry for that. Uh, uh, let me restate what I what I started to say. Duterte is also using drone surveillance, uh, attack helicopters, artillery, and aerial bombs 
to attack indigenous communities and other upland peasant settlements, which are considered by the military as guerrilla bases of the New People's Army. These attacks on civilian communities are in gross violation of human rights and international humanitarian law and are intended to grab the land for the benefit of foreign and uh, local mining, logging, and plantation companies. And um, so to uh, stay on this topic then, um, has it always been like this? for the Filipino environmental activists, or how did the U.S.-backed Duterte regime aggravate their situation? The Duterte regime has been the worst assailant of the land and environmental defenders and indigenous people since the downfall of the Marcos dictatorship. I've already referred to the hundreds of land and environmental defenders that he has butchered and the indigenous and other upland peasant communities that he has indiscriminately bombed. It is remarkable that Duterte had at first appointed Regina Lopez, a highly dedicated and much admired environmentalist, who was very vocal against corporate mining and uh, uh, especially open pit mining and other ecologically destructive projects. As his secretary, for environment and natural resources. Then Duterte figuratively stabbed her in the back by allowing her appointment to be bypassed by the Commission on Appointments. Not yet one year into her uh, Department of Energy and Natural Resources post, but already undertaking some very positive pro-environment measures, Lopez was unceremoniously replaced in 2017 by one of the Duterte's trusted henchmen, ex-AAP chief uh, of staff and retired General Roy uh, Simato, who is an instrument in drawing bribes from the mining companies and making uh, 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 graph-laden projects like the Dolomite uh, uh, sand uh, placement uh, um, uh, along the Manila Bay. Duterte quickly lifted the official ban on new mining agreements, uh, uh, EO 79, issued by then President Benigno Aquino III in 2012. Under his new EO 130 and a militarized DNR, foreign mining firms rapidly expanded their operations, including brazenly legal magnetite black sand quarrying operations. Uh, by Chinese firms. Uh, mineral ores are being taken out of the country without any documentation. They are being smuggled out. Military operations quickly intensified, especially in Mindanao, where many rural communities had been strongly opposing the destructive mines. Thank you again for your insight. Um, so the peasant activists um, in the Philippines are at the forefront of the struggle against the climate crisis, but um, the discussion on climate change is loaded uh, with technical jar jargon. Um, how do the mass activists conduct education and propaganda on this subject? Indeed, the peasant activists in the Philippines are at the forefront of the struggle against the climate crisis. The mass activists learn from the peasant masses first their conditions, needs, and demands, and thus they know how to avoid the technical jargon of scientists, discuss the climate crisis in understandable terms, and succeed at their educational and propaganda work on the subject. The important thing is that the peasant communities' daily concerns are explained in ways that show how these are linked to scientific concepts such as climate change phenomena. Ordinary people can readily connect worse floods, typhoons, droughts, even infestations to climate change when the causal links are explained in simple terms. Peasants and IPs or indigenous peoples are 
are in fact more observant because their production and daily lives are tightly intertwined with natural cycles and specific ecosystems. A um, short um, follow-up question to this again, and how can the petty bourgeoisie help in education and propaganda work? The petty bourgeois with formal education from the bourgeois universities can help a lot in education and propaganda work if they learn to distinguish the pro-imperialist and reactionary ideas from the correct ideas that he can begin to learn uh, especially from social investigation and from the masses. He can advance wave upon wave in gaining correct knowledge uh, through the continuous interaction of revolutionary theory and practice. All scientific questions that involve fairly recent discoveries and technology applications, especially those that impact on people's health, daily lives and livelihoods, must of course be first correctly understood and validated by leading activists through their own rigorous research and social investigation. This is what differentiates revolutionary activists from sleek demagogues. An alliance between science and activism can make sure that such understanding is brought to public awareness, leading to effective mass response. The Philippine mass movement has no lack of such a scientific mass base. There has long been close cooperation on environmental issues by scientists, research institutions, NGOs advocating ecology issues, and people's rights and mass organizations, and allies in the academy, academy like AGHAM, you know, then the mass media, even churches and local officials. Let us recall, for example, the sudden rise in public consciousness about climate change in the aftermath of Typhoon Yolanda, when the entire world's focus was on Philippines, the Philippines is one tragic example. Through the correct approach and persistence in mass education and propaganda, key scientific terms can soon escape the jargon house, become part of popular usage, and represent a higher level of mass understanding about important social issues. Just consider, for example, how epidemiology terms and scientific debates have become part of the global uh, awareness in just the past two years of the COVID pandemic. Thank you again for, so for all of us uh, listening to this, um, let us be encouraged to help in um, educating and in doing propaganda work. Um, so how should the mass organizations proceed now that the Glasgow conference has been concluded? How can we ensure that it won't be another Kyoto Protocol or Paris Agreement, another band aid? solution? The mass organizations dedicated to system change and solving the climate crisis should persevere in arousing, organizing, and mobilizing the people to condemn the continuing attempts of the U.S. and other imperialist powers to prevent real solutions to the climate crisis and continue to take super profits from dependency on fossil fuel. At the same time, they must also expose and oppose the many schemes by big tech monopolies and big finance groups for riding on popular green technologies, but only to strengthen their monopolies, open up new investment niches, and rake in more super profits while hiding the fact that they still remain dependent on fossil fuel corporate consumers, both upstream and downstream on the supply chain. And what about revolutionary movement, not just in the Philippines, but, um, but around the world? How can they unite to end climate imperialism? There are already international and anti-imperialist and democratic united front organizations like the ILPS, 
i corps and others which are uniting to fight and end climate imperialism. The revolutionary movements around the world are, of course, not the only ones that are fighting to end imperialism as the historical cause of global warming in the industrial era. In recent years, millions have marched in the streets to protest the weak, obscurantist and evasive responses of imperialist states to the climate problem. Like I said in response to some earlier questions, there is a great need to, for a broader unity in fighting climate imperialism. The workers, peasants, uh, youth, women, and indigenous peoples' movements have important roles to play in giving sustained uh, power to this important area of struggle so that it is not limited to lobbying the UN and holding ritualized protests uh, during uh, COP meetings. In this recent uh, COP meeting in Glasgow, uh, the non-governmental organizations were uh, excluded. And what about in the Philippines, Tito? Um, how can national industrialization and genuine agrarian reform ensure the safety of our country against imperialist plunder? First of all, there must be full national independence. The Filipino people and their revolutionary forces must achieve national liberation from imperialism and the puppet reactionary forces before there can be genuine land reform and national industrialization. At the same time, national liberation must be powered by genuine popular sovereignty or people's democracy in the various fields to ensure that imperialism and its local reactionary forces cannot easily launch a comeback or engineer disruptions that will sabotage land reform and national industrialization. Um, and does the Communist Party of the Philippines or the National Democratic Front um, have a specific program addressing the climate issue? Yes, of course. The CPP and NDFP have a program of wisely utilizing the natural resources and promoting a clean and healthy environment. They are against imperialist powers and their puppets continuing to plunder and degrade the environment and take out our natural resources as they please. When they are already in power, the CPP and NDFP will take care to protect the environment and use the natural resources without ruining and degrading the environment and without contributing to the climate crisis. In the context of the aborted NDFP GRP peace talks uh, from 2016 to 2018, the NDFP was able to forge a comprehensive draft, uh, uh, the comprehensive agreement on social and economic reforms that proposed a, uh, a number of provisions for environmental protection. Uh, this could have been implemented upon the advance of the talks. Even as uh, this need to rely on the strength of other socioeconomic, political and constitutional reforms, especially on uh, agrarian reform and rural development and uh, uh, national industrialization and economic development as the pillars of socioeconomic reform. Um, to follow up on this question, how is this uh, program being implemented? Uh, the CPP, NPA and the NDFP are now waging a people's democratic revolution to fight and stop the imperialist powers and their local puppets from plundering and destroying the environment with their open pit mining, logging and monocrop plantations, and from perpetuating dependency on imported fossil fuel. Inspired and strengthened by the CPP-led forces and often taking the cue from the pro-environment policies and program of the NDFA, so many communities, groups, and activists of all colors have in fact been launching mass struggles to oppose specific cases of environmental destruction. So many environmental NGOs, institutions, and allies have been supporting them and defending them against state repression. In that sense, 
the climate justice movement in the Philippines. It's not just a CPP-led mass struggle, but a broad movement by the entire people. Thank you for clarifying. Um, and lastly, let's, uh, Tito, um, can you tell us how will the world be in a socialist society? What is the future of our planet in a socialist society? And how significant is our fight to end capitalism in building a better planet? The world will be fundamentally better when the world capitalist system is ended and socialism reigns. In fact, the end of capitalism in the entire world will usher in communism, a classless society. In the meantime, the proletariat is striving to win the socialist revolution in various countries before monopoly capitalism can be totally ended. The Filipino proletariat and entire people are now struggling to win the new democratic revolution and proceed to the socialist revolution. They are thus making a significant contribution <coughs> to the world proletarian revolution for, for socialism and communism. The world has had ample experience of socialist construction in the Soviet Union from 1917 to 1956, Maoist China from 1949 to 1976, and in several other countries where proletarian parties won political power to prove the assertions of Marx, Engels, Lenin, and Mao about the socialist system providing the best conditions for ensuring ecological balance and sustainability. Mao displayed the most uh, advanced understanding in this regard, especially in his work on the 10 great relationships and in pushing for state policies which advanced that framework. From the 1950s until 1976, China has offered a pioneering and shining example of how to rapidly build a modern socialist economy by walking on two legs, meaning to say, combining traditional and appropriate technology with modern industry, achieving zero waste levels of production, encouraging thrift and eschewing waste and profligacy. Socialism upholds the primacy of social benefit as against uh, uh, the uh, capitalist profit motive and provides central economic planning. This removes the root cause of capitalism's systemic crisis of overproduction and destructive competition, allows for appropriate balance among the various components of the social economy. Socialist culture encourages a high level of commitment among the people to nurture their homeland and its resources for the benefit of future generations. Most importantly, the scientific outlook of proletarian ideology combines advanced theory with people's practice, relies on mass initiative to solve problems, and encourages self-criticism to point out weaknesses and provide lessons which are crucial for a socialist society to face the scientific challenges of climate change. Thank you, Tito, for um, answering our questions for today. Salamat. Um, so before we go on a short break, I would just like to let you all know that the floor is now open for um, um, your question. So please um, send us your question and just send us a message, post them in the comments and we'll be uh, discussing them after the break with Tito Jo. Um, and for now, we're gonna have a short break where we're gonna play a video on um, the, I'm sorry, um, what's the video again? Um, it's <laughs> the demolition of Pico del Oro, um, a seven to eight minute video that we'll be watching. And uh, yeah, I will see you all and Tito back uh, again after the break. Um, as I said, please send us your questions um, yes, thank you. Oh, 
Garcia na isang mahingis na at magsasaka ang iniling lang namin na gusto namin ito na manatili rito at kung dadalain kami sa ano bayan paano naman yung hanap buhay namin wala kami hanap buhay doon kaya pinahindigan namin at talagang dito na hindi kami aalis nung unang panahon wala pa naman nagmamayari nito eh namulatan na namin eh ngayon lang nagkaroon na ng kalsada sa kasila aangkinin ah, na kanila. Dito po sa sa aming sa kapat po ng Kabite ay 602 hectares. Ang kiniklaim ni Berata sa Kasalukuyan. Kasama na po itong aming lugar. Ang balak pong gawin dito ng Maria Teresa Berata ay sa gawin po ng Wits Resorts tapos po isang hotel. Binenta po ito kay Hendres eh. Kasi malaki na rin na kasi nababali nila doon sa kay Hendres eh na pera eh. Kaya ay pinupursigin nila na makuha itong barangay na ito. Gusto na nilang ipagawa. Lahat-lahat po, kahit ano pong mga tulong sa gobyerno, simula ho ng 2014, hindi na po kami nakakatanggap. Kaya masakit po para sa amin. Bago nangyari yung demolition, pumunta ang DSWD dyan at kukunin daw ang mga bata. Hindi ko alam kung bakit, kung anong target nila at ang mga bata gusto nilang kunin. Pinapirma ang mga bata at, at mga ina. Dati talagang daan namin ito. Ngayon, anang nangyari? Ang ginawa ng mga security, di, ano, binakuran yung kalsada doon at ayaw na kaming padaanin. Ayan, barak siya ng security at saka yan, at saka yun. Wala na kasing natura sa amin. Ang aming kapitan, wala na. Mga konsihal, wala na. Barangay, wala na. Nandun na pati mayor, pati gobernador, hindi na kami hinaharap. Eh, paano kami mabuhay? Magdaragat kami. Malayo ang dagat sa relocation, sinasabi nila. Hindi namin kakayanin. Masyado talaga nila kami ginigipit. August 22, tumutol po ang mga tao Nagkaroon po ng demolition crew, PNP, so may nakadeploy din po ng mga Air Force, mga 50 Air Force, dito sa aming lugar. Ito ang harang namin noong magdemolish. Hinarangan namin mga aroma at saka yan. Kasi ang mga military gusto na rin pumasok dito at saka demolition team. Kaya hinarangan namin yan at binantayan namin at ayaw namin makapasok sila sa amin. Nakapasok po sila, ngayon may nasira po, may naidimulis po ng labing limang bahay. Nung nakapasok sila, bahay namin unang nagiba, iba unang bungad ng bungad. Tsaka yung mga anak ko nag-iiyak na sa loob ng bahay, habang ginigiba, eh, ayaw lumabas. Ako na lang nagpalabas at baka madaganan nga ng mga ano, kahoy. So pagdating ko ng 23, disiplinado at organisado, hinarap po namin ang demolition crew at PNP. Ang hinarangan namin ng mga bangka dyan, yung ano na yun, taon na yun, para hindi lang makapasok. Talagang lumaban kami ng batuhan para hindi lang makapasok sila. Lumaban ang mga tao, tumindig, 
Ang nangyari po, eh, hindi po, hindi po sila nagtagumpay. Ang ginawa po ng mga PNP, naghagis po ng limang bisis ng tergas at nagpaputok. Hindi na po sila ng ano dyan, tapos dinala nila doon. Sinakal, tapos binugbong pa nila. Ang anak ko. Itong mga batong ito, <clears throat> hinakot namin doon sa mga ginibang bahay. At yan, yan ang aming pambato rin sa kanila. Kasi wala kaming panlaban sa kanila, kundi yan mga batong yan. Kaya kasalanan ba namin lumaban kami sa kanila, ayaw namin umalis dito. Eh, sa ganang akin, tama lang yung ginagawa namin. At saka hindi naman kami ang unang ng bato eh. Uh, yan po yung pandepensa namin dahil wala kami ibang gamit na panlaban, kundi niya na lang eh. Ay sa kanila, marami silang panlaban. Pag tinirgas ka, wala ka na magawa. Eh, hindi ka na makita, papasok na lang sila, di, lalo na mag iba mga bahay. Sana ay i-pull out ho ang PNP at ang security guard at itigil, itigil po ang akmang demolisyon kasi sa katunayan po sa kasalukuyan ay tuloy-tuloy pa rin po ang amba nilang pagdidemolis dito sa amin. Dapat pa i-pull out na yung mga gwardiyan at saka yung mga pulis na yun. Wala namang kaguluhan dito, sila lang nang humahanap ng gulo rito eh. Nananahimik ang tao rito, guguluhin nila. Sana huwag na nilang guluhin ang tao rito sa patungan. Kasi hindi naman magulong ng lugar ito eh. Pag wala na sila rito, mapayapa na ang namumuhay dito ang mga tao eh. Kang nandito na umpisa na, simula na eh. Ito papatuloy na namin paglalaban dito hanggang mayroon pa kami ipapaglaban. Beauty na ka, no? Uh, hello, wala kang audio, Edna? Oh, I'm sorry. I was uh, muted. Welcome back um, to Andy Line Online with Tito Jo. Um, we uh, will be answering the audience questions now. So if you have any questions, you can still send them in. Um, and our question from Chini de Guzman is, can we conclude that the move to solve the climate crisis is doomed to fail as long as capitalism and imperialism remain. Hunger and famine that they predict in 2050 will eventually happen. And as I said before, so long as uh, the monopoly capitalist uh, powers, uh, which I call uh, a, a fossil fuel uh, uh, monsters, and uh, their um, uh, oil, uh, gas, and coal monopolies uh, are in power. Uh, they will do everything uh, to uh, uh, make profits and and prevent uh, the solution of uh, the climate crisis uh, by reducing dependence on uh, fossil fuel. Um, now, if they have their way, and uh, despite the rising people's clamor for solution to the climate crisis, then uh, when two degrees Celsius uh, above the pre-industrial level is reached, uh, there will be a uh, wide areas of hunger and famine because the heat waves, the heat waves will uh, uh, destroy uh, 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 food production on land and um, uh, there will be also the problem of drought uh, inter, uh, you know uh, the, the uh, interplay of uh, drought uh, and uh, uh, floods because uh, the uh, uh, the heating of the surface of the 
earth would mean the uh, melting the icebergs and that would result in raising the sea level the sea level you know uh, 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 prevents the outflow of water from the mountains so uh, after you have heat waves and drought uh, which destroy the crops uh, then the floods uh, follow uh, which makes sure uh, that the food production is uh, rendered impossible so uh, in if this when this will happen uh, certainly the people will rise up i think uh, uh, to save their own lives uh, the people will rise up and uh, because if uh, the fossil uh, fuel imperialist powers uh, do not change um, uh, their policies uh, then they they uh, have to be overthrown by the people in the various countries where these powers are uh, are seated. Uh, as a matter of fact, you know the problem is no longer global warming even now, and the problem is uh, global heating. Uh, if you will notice so many, uh, how long the, the droughts are, the heat waves, and the, the forest fires, uh, uh, they are, they're occurring so frequently now, even before um, uh, the two degrees is reached. Uh, and you know, uh, the, uh, the heating of the globe will be accelerated, will be cumulative. You know? um, so, uh, um, by the time, uh, you know, two degrees uh, Celsius would be a, um, a crucial point, no? But then uh, I presume that humankind will try to save itself by overthrowing those responsible for the climate uh, crisis. Uh, thank you again for that um, answer. Um, we hope that your um, question was answered um, to your content. Um, and we've got another question. Um, and as for now, it's the last. So if you guys have any other uh, questions, please um, comment down below or send us a message. Um, the natural disasters in the Philippines and other countries in the global south have worsened in the last decade. The socialist revolution will most likely not come in the immediate future. What can we do until then to ensure the safety of our people? It is true that the natural disasters in the Philippines and other countries in the global south have worsened uh, because of uh, uh, the carbon dioxide emissions made mainly by the imperialist powers. Uh, you must know um, uh, who are the main contributors to the 1.6 uh, trillion uh, tons of uh, uh, carbon dioxide uh, emitted. No? Um, uh, it is actually the European countries since uh, 1671, um, because you know this is the uh, part of the world, uh, especially Western Europe, where the industrial revolution started. So um, Europe, the European countries have been responsible for. Uh, uh, 600 uh, uh, billion tons and uh, the US comes next with uh, 400 uh, billion tons and uh, China comes in third uh, with 200 and um, uh, this uh, um, 
uh, uh, China did this, uh, uh, emitted this amount in the last four decades, you know, because of its rapid uh, uh, industrialization of the use of coal. So the Philippines and um, other underdeveloped countries in the South have their own contributions uh, also to the climate crisis. Um, uh, let me point out that the Philippines is dependent on fossil fuel, especially imported fuel. And then um, the, there has been a, a lot of deforestation going on in the Philippines uh, since uh, after World War, uh, after the end of World War II. Uh, Japan, you know, I'll give you an example. Japan and then uh, some other East Asian countries and then China would get black sand uh, uh, and then other mineral ores all over the Philippines. And Japan is uh, distinguished, is notorious for um, um, uh, taking the Bakawan uh, from the, from the uh, <coughs> what do you call that, the swamp land uh, along the coast. No? And you know, this is a, a good protection uh, uh, against uh, typhoons. It used to be said that the forest of Mindanao uh, was, a, was an effective shield, but then those forests were depleted, were uh, very much reduced. So, you know, um, typhoons would uh, hit hard. No? They could easily come into the islands and hit hard. Uh, let's say even Mindanao, which used to be secure. And uh, with the worsening of, um, of uh, global warming, uh, the, the, the Pacific Ocean has become a uh, highway, a highway, a speedway, in fact, for uh, typhoons uh, that hit the Philippines. So you, you have uh, more than 20 uh, um, uh, strong typhoons coming into the Philippines every year. You know? That's very destructive. And uh, uh, when you have typhoons, you have the uh, floods and the landslides. And then uh, what comes next would be the drought. No? So these are very destructive, uh, extreme weather, weather conditions. Um, well, right now, after, this, after uh, the setbacks uh, uh, to the socialist cause, since 1956, uh, um, becoming larger after the collapse of the, uh, after China itself became capitalist and then the Soviet Union collapsed. If you use this as markers, the socialist cause, the work and the working class movement took some beating. Uh, but then uh, the crisis of the, uh, especially the, the crisis of uh, overproduction of the world capitalist system will become worse and worse. Uh, the United States used to boast uh, of itself as uh, sole superpower since 1991, but even the U.S. has, the, has degenerated, has declined further. And uh, uh, the relationship between uh, uh, China and U.S. as partners in promoting uh, neoliberal uh, globalization would be strained. Uh, um, uh, especially uh, uh, in the uh, worsening of uh, the financial and economic crisis that's of capitalism that started in 2008. No, um, uh, by the time Obama was in power, uh, there was already uh, a policy uh, decision of the U.S. Uh, uh, to. Uh, remove the concessions uh, to remove and uh, to reduce and remove the concessions made to China. Uh, this is the uh, uh, result of uh, the crisis of the world capitalist system. All basic contradictions in the world um, capitalist system uh, have become, have been intensifying. The contradictions between labor and capital in imperialist countries contradictions between imperialism and oppressed nations and peoples, the contradictions among 
the imperialist powers, and now the contradictions between the two strongest uh, uh, capitalist powers, the U.S. and, uh, and, and China. So uh, under conditions of uh, climate crisis worsening, combining with the uh, social crisis, uh, which intensifies the class, the anti-imperialist and class struggle, then socialism will make a, re uh, a, a big rebound. Eh? It will research uh, for sure, and these are now and this is now indicated by the uh, uh, rapid spread of anti-imperialist and democratic struggles. So uh, don't you worry. We're exactly at the point that imperial that imperialism is doing its worst. That's exactly the time when people rise up. Uh, they overthrow uh, imperialism and uh, establish socialism. That's how the Soviet Union arose in 1917. And oh, that's also how China um, uh, overthrew uh, imperialism and the local reactionary classes in a matter of uh, some uh, 29 years. No? and since the founding of the communist party so i think there will be um there will be a, a, a repetition of this process in which uh, the proletariat and people will surely rise up against uh, imperialism and uh, all its puppet uh, reactionary classes uh, look uh, uh, all its reactionary puppet classes Um, what do we do in the meantime then? As I said, uh, we simply have to do AOM, arouse, organize, and mobilize the people along the, uh, the anti-imperialist and democratic line. Uh, we have to pursue uh, the national democratic uh, movement and uh, the people's democratic revolution. Yes, precisely. Um, so with what is happening in the world today, um, the socialist revolution cannot be far. And uh, until then, arouse, organize, mobilize, as Tito Jo said, and um, educate, help in educating and doing propaganda work for, to, uh, for the masses. Um, Salamat, Tito Jo. Thank you so much for joining us today. Can you hear us? <laughs> okay. Uh, I am pleased that this, uh, that this uh, episode uh, uh, has, is coming to a close. I'm happy because... Uh, 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 we the, the uh, topic of climate crisis and uh, system change uh, uh, is uh, absolutely of high importance, and uh, I think we have uh, gained enough information and knowledge to be able to act uh, wisely and militantly against the imperialist powers that have been uh, the cause uh, of climate crisis together with their uh, oil, uh, uh, gas, and uh, coal monopolies. And we know exactly uh, who are our friends uh, and uh, who are our enemies in the struggle against climate crisis and for system change. Yes, exactly. Um, as as was said, yeah, this is the culmination of our series on the climate crisis. Um, tune in um, um, to our social media and we will let you know what our next series will be or the next topics will be. Um, and for until then, again, thank you everyone for tuning in and watching. Thank you, Tito Joe, for answering our questions. Uh, may I thank uh, Edna for nicely uh, and uh, uh, skillfully hosting uh, this episode. And also let me thank uh, all our uh, listeners uh, for uh, participating. Yes, 
Thank you, everyone. And um, before we end this uh, this uh, broadcast, let's uh, listen to a closing song. Ang Pilipinong 